Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and um, I would be remiss if I did not also praise Dr. Sullivan. You've heard so many great things about him, but for me, he is truly a health hero and a health warrior because he opened the door for all of us to be here today. So, Dr. Sullivan, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here with you today, and I was, uh, all of us, as you heard, were asked to keep our remarks short, so I will try and keep them brief. We're asked to comment a little bit about our tenure as Surgeon General and some of the challenges that we had. Well, one of the things that's apparent is, is that the Surgeon General really is a reflection of the times and how they serve. So as Surgeon General, when I came in, there's two wars, there's disparities, there's a whole host of challenges before us. And if you look at the history of each Surgeon General, you see that, in fact, each of us have reflected the times that we served in. <clears throat> the job of Surgeon General is to protect, promote, and advance the health, safety, and security of the United States. An extraordinarily simple value proposition on paper, but unusually difficult to carry out in a very hyperpartisan environment. When I first took office, one of the persons besides those that you see here who are my mentors, because there is no training program for Surgeon Generals, you just parachute in. <laughs> and you hit the ground running. But I remember sitting with Surgeon General Coop one day and I was looking at all the data as far as the disease and economic burden and the challenges before us. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I looked at Coop and I said, you know, with, with all due deference, Surgeon General Coop, uh, why did you leave all this stuff for me to do? <laughs> and he said to me, son, you will understand soon. And it's true, because it's a very different environment that we get a chance to work in. <laughs> Often as a Surgeon General, you're frustrated. And I used to joke that sometimes I felt like a cemetery caretaker. That is, that there's a lot of people below me, but nobody's listening. And then there are other days that I felt like a priest because often I would go to convocations like this, like all the Surgeon Generals, and especially when I was in the White House and we'd be at the, what they called the mess, uh, the White House mess, where the president has a little dining room where we'd eat and the VIPs and dignitaries would come in and I'd eat. And often I'd sit at a table and I'd be at a meeting and they'd all come and sit down at the table and the, the mess is run by a Navy chief. And he'd come and say, Admiral, what would you like for breakfast? And I'd say, well, go ahead and get their order first. And everybody would say, no, no have him order first. And you know why? Because after everybody ordered, and my, my breakfast was pretty boring. It was uh, oatmeal, some orange juice, some milk, and some fruit. And everybody else would order their bacon and eggs and all this stuff. And then they look at me and say, you know, I don't normally eat like this, okay? <laughs> so it was almost like you're getting a confession there as well. What's pervasive through all of us, all of our tenures, has been this issue of health inequity, of social injustice, of health disparities. And it really is a commentary on our society and how poorly we've done over time in dealing with these issues because we know that the greatest indicator of health status in the world is your socioeconomic status. It is pretty clear in the work that David and some of our colleagues did in the social determinants of health. My bias as Surgeon General was informed by my childhood. I grew up in the hood, product of immigrant parents who spoke no English, and I grew up in Harlem. I was born in Harlem, and I grew up in Harlem. I know what it's like to wait on long lines at a public hospital to get health care. I know what it's like to be homeless and hungry. I know what it's like to struggle every day, not live paycheck to paycheck, but to live day by day. So those are the, that's the baggage I bought with me because it was probably the best education I had to really be the Surgeon General because I've walked in those shoes. I understand those injustices. I understand the pain. I understand the indignities. I understand what it's like to be a person of color in a very white world where discrimination was rampant back in the 50s and the 60s. But yet, as I learned later in the Army, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And it did help me a great deal. So just briefly, in my time, my portfolio was about prevention, preparedness, health disparities, health literacy, cultural competence, global health, and, and using health as a diplomatic tool, not only to, to eradicate these disparities, but with that comes economic opportunity. It gives people hope and aspiration so that there's a better world, that they can educate their children, that they can vaccinate their children, and people can be healthier. 
the health disparity issue hasn't changed. And, and the sad part is through decades of service of Surgeon Generals, we all are fighting these same battles. It has been said that we are all created equal, but it's apparent to most of us that some of us are more equal than others. And that's been a challenge for all of us through the years. You know, I remember a story, as many of you know, I, I started out as a surgeon and I went into public health as a second career, went back to graduate school. And of course, as a surgeon, I call myself a recovering surgeon because, you know, if you ask a surgeon to name the best three surgeons in the world, they always have trouble naming the other two. <laughs> and I remember this, you know, some of these little vignettes that talk about the politics. When President Reagan was in office and there was an attempt on his life and he was taken into the GW hospital and the trauma chief there was a guy named Giordano, a trauma surgeon. And the president was very jovial, although he was hypotensive and he was in shock and having all kinds of problems. The Secret Service was worried. And the, surgeon, the trauma surgeon went over to him and said, Mr. President, you're bleeding into your chest. We have to get you into the operating room. This is a true story. And the president was shaking everybody's hand and being, being a politician, even though he was in shock. And the president grabbed Dr. G. O'Donnell's hand and said, OK, doctor, take me to the operating room. But I hope you're all Republicans. <laughs> and Dr. G. O'Donnell said to him, Mr. President, Today, we are all Republicans. That was the right answer. Because what it tells you is, health does not have a party. Health disparities does not have a party. And the problem is, we have a problem with our politics in this country. So maybe to point out some of the, some of the obvious, Dr. Murthy, I think we would all just get up behind him and say ditto. We are on that bandwagon with him, okay? We understand. And one of the things we all agree on, once a Surgeon General, always a Surgeon General. So we're all on the same team. We're all preaching the same gospel. The challenge, of course, is this, you heard my, my portfolio, but within that portfolio and within all of their portfolios was this variable that we call politics. And why is that important? Because Politics has a morbidity and mortality of its own. Now I'm going to, give, I'm going to tell you why that, it's so important. It's a nuisance. We're all embarrassed about the things we hear and see. Don't forget that when good policy is not promulgated, when bad policy comes forward, there is a morbidity and mortality with that. In my tenure, stem cells, abortion, plan B, disparities, they all became political, volatile subjects. Yet for each of us, looking through a scientific lens, there was a clear path forward. The Affordable Care Act, which we argue about today, okay, is about social justice. It's about health justice. It's about it correcting inequalities. And the Democrats got beat up for that. But do you know where that came from? If President Romney had won the election, we'd have Romney care today. And you know it would look just like Affordable Care Act because he did the same thing in Massachusetts. That's the challenge with politics. It is so disingenuous. The Democrats were beat up because they were forcing people to enroll in health care. That was a Republican initiative decades before. This is about people. It's not about politics. And as Surgeon Generals, we recognize we are not the doctor of the Republicans or the Democrats. We are the, have a much more important job. We are the doctor of the people. We do what's right best on the, based on the best science. Now, we can't correct these problems today until we address many of the issues that Surgeon General Murphy mentioned. We cannot achieve health equality until we have social equality and social justice and correct those injustices. We are inextricably tied to our past. And I'll close with just one remark from German philosopher George Hegel, who back in the 18th century noted, what we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. And today we have an opportunity, we're at a critical juncture where we must, must change the way we do business and health. The disease and economic burden that's upon us continues to mount. It's disproportionately represented in people of color. And even if you don't have a heart and you don't have compassion, make a good business decision. Fix the damn problem. Thanks very much.